So Adam had dominion over everything. So he was a man, he was a man that reflects the image of God. So when you when you ask him, what does God look like? Look at Adam. Because the Bible that God made him in his image and his likeness. So he was a perfect expression of what a God would look like. That was Adam. And that was before the fall. And what led to the fall was this. Did God really say? What is the point I'm driving at today? If you are really going to be very stable emotionally, the very first thing to do is to take God's word for what he's saying. God is not joking. God is not playing. God meant everything that he said. And God said it because it is able to address every pending situation in our lives. There has to be a sincere alignment back to God for you to find that balance. See, God never created you to live by rules. Even check, I'll tell you why God was tired of the law. Because no one could keep the law. It was too much, 600 and something laws. Because God, by design, we were not created to live by laws. By design. By our initial configuration. It wasn't laws that brings us to what we want. No. It was that image of God in us. Because that was what we lost when Adam fell. That is the only thing we must pursue for us to find balance in our emotional life. Until you start to pursue a sincere alignment with God. It must be something you do consciously, like Adam would do. So that meant that Adam found his strength, Adam found his courage, Adam found his, his, um, his, his definition for life by the fellowship that he had with God on a consistent basis. I want us to check 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel 30. And I want us to read verse the 6. First Samuel 30 verse 6. It says, Now David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning because the soul of all the people who was grieved, every man for his son and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. But David, another scripture says that David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. Verse 7, Then David said to Abiata the priest, Abimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiata brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue for you Fully overtake them without fail and without and, and without fail recover all. Verse 9. So David went, he and six hundred men who were with him, and came to the brook of Basil, where those stayed who were left behind. Verse 10. But David pursued. He and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind, who were very weary that they could not cross the brook business. The key thing I want to emphasize, or I want to stress on this morning, is verse 6. And it says, and David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. 
And towards the end, he says, But David strengthened himself in the Lord. If you read from verse 1, you will get the better um, foundation of what happened. All the men in this, in this um, story, they have all cried. And they've cried out. The Bible says that they've cried so much that they have no more strength to cry. Even David, he cried so much because his wives, his children, and his daughters have been taken away. But David was greatly distressed. Whenever you hear of the word distress, the first thing that comes to your mind, or the very first thing we can relate to, it's a building that is about to crash. Some, I mean, once in a while, men from the Lagos State Enforcement or State Enforcement generally goes around checking for distressed buildings. And when they see that a building is distressed, one of the things they do is that they mark it for demolition. They say that this building is risky. Nobody should live here. And over the, over the years, actually, we have seen several cases of, of collapsed buildings. And that's because it's when the buildings were distressed, no one observed or no one did anything, so they eventually collapsed. The last major collapse we had was somewhere in Lagos Island. It was so bad that, you know, a couple of children were trapped in the building that collapsed. So in other words, God was saying, I mean, the account of the scripture was saying that David had hit a point when he was going to collapse. So we began to talk about emotional balance or emotional stability. And we want to stress on the fact that if certain things are not being addressed emotionally, it can lead to a collapse. And when a collapse happened, it's almost, it takes more work actually to pull up a collapsed building than to identify that something is going wrong and hence there is a need to address it. Most of the time when people collapse in their life, um, what we see on the outside is the collapse. We just see them fall. But before any man falls, there is all a danger signal, or let me use the word, before any man comes to the point, before any man gets to their breaking point, there is always a sign or a distress sign, something that points to you that something is not going right somewhere. I'll take a bit of time this morning because, I, because this is a very... Um, it's a very sensitive to you, so I'm not going to rush. The only thing, someone once said, the only thing that cannot collapse, that cannot break, is the grace of God. You can stretch the grace of God and it will still not break. But human beings, we can break. And one of the greatest signs to watch out for in our lives is, is, I mean, are those seasons when things in our lives are pointing to us that we're either reaching for a breakdown and we need to pay attention to put ourselves together. I've been married for a couple of years now 
and I can tell you that marriage is beautiful. If you are not married yet and you are, and you are within marriageable age, you should go marry. Every good and every great marriage is built on trust. But there are things that makes marriages break. And before every marriage break, there is always something that is that shows distress sign. Look at the scripture we're reading. And David was greatly distressed. Most times when people break up in marriage, that I'm not teaching marriage seminar this morning. I'm just trying to take it one step at a time. I'm going to be I'm going to be very slow this morning. Most of the time when marriages break up, before the major break happens, there is always a distress sign. There is always something that keeps happening. And these things happen over and over and over and over. And then it begins to... It, be, it becomes, like I used to say, it becomes a stronghold. Or let me say, it then begins to put the marriage... You know marriage is like a building. You are building. So if something keeps going wrong every time, it shakes the foundation. It shakes the building. It threatens. It threatens the building because, like I said... I use the example of buildings that have been distressed to explain what the Bible says that and David was greatly, he didn't even use the word distressed, there was that emphasis on greatly. And I've been at several points in my marriage when I, when I, believe, I, when I believe that there are distress signs, but that's much more. One of the things that I have learned over the years, remaining a married man, is to learn to deal with issues, especially issues that are not seen. I'm going somewhere and I'm not going to rush. I, I know a lot of people are scared to marry. A lot right now don't even want to marry. Some don't even want to hear it. But trust me, the trouble in marriage is worth it. Because in the long run, you would have learned and you would have grown and you would have developed, you would have developed. And David was greatly distressed. Hmm. The key thing I want to stress here is what led to the, to the, to the reason why David was greatly distressed. And how was he able to deal with distress? One of the things I do in marriage, one of the things I do and I do over and over, is that I talk. And no matter how bad things get, I know you're not married now, some of you, but you'll get married someday. And no matter how bad things get, one of the things I realize is as long as there is a communication line still open, it creates hope. But, but sometimes, you know, even though I'm a pastor, but I'm still a human, sometimes I don't even talk to my wife. <laughs> Are you serious? I say, yes. <laughs> No, sometimes I could just I could get so angry with things and I just keep quiet. But over the years, I've real, I've come to learn that there are certain kind of silence that is not even healthy. And I don't know I don't know before we even got married, we made a deal that no matter how bad things get, we would never go to bed without resolving it. It worked for a couple of years. <laughs> you worked for <laughs> you worked for a couple of years, 
And, and so at the early stages, and no matter how bad things really got, at night we just sit down and talk about it and say, oh, don't worry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But so after a while, I just got tired. I said, I'm not sorry again. <laughs> you know? but, but over the years, I just realized that no matter how bad things get, as long as there is still a communication line, as long as we are still able to talk, as long as we are still able, so, so I, mean, I mean, let me not say, um, so what I have learned as I get angry, I could get angry sometimes, but I try as much as possible to really tell anger, no, 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 I mean, it's a victory I've had over the years. Uh, if, if not for the impact of the word of God in my life, oh my God, I'll be, I'll be a very angry person. But sometimes I still get angry. If you've never been married, you know that living with a woman is a beautiful thing. I mean, very beautiful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, it's not a marriage class. I'm just trying to use, I'm trying to explain that things happen that brings us to a point when we feel distress. But as far as God is concerned, God is not God is very concerned about the things that happen but God is also much more concerned about the things that we do when we are distressed because most of the 80% of decisions that we make when we are distressed they are always decisions that are never right but but I've made I've, I mean I've gotten hungry at some point in marriage, only for me to just be quiet for a couple of days, I just like wake up. You know, when you can't even say good morning clearly, you say, mm, just to, at least just to talk. Mm, yes, you know, every, every answer short. Are you going out? Yes. And sometimes, you know, you get angry so bad that you'll be in your heart answering yes, hoping that she will. She will, be, she will come and say hello, but sometimes you will wait for that hello. <laughs> you, you'll get married someday, so you'll get there. It's nothing like that. <laughs> it's, uh, eh? He's like that. Oh, you are like that too. And sometimes I will, will lie down on the bed together, and I'm pressing my phone, and I'll be like, can't you just say something? Oh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> at, least, at least I've been quiet for three days. She should be, she should be kind enough. <laughs> at least, you know, praise the Lord. Yeah, but I'm tired, but pride won't let me say something first. <laughs> but the annoying thing is, sometimes after all the drama and we start to talk, then I realize that, oh, I was actually the one even wrong. <laughs> oh, you are there. I said, so I actually got angry and I punished myself for three days. I wouldn't even talk to the only person that encourages me in the world. What we do when we are distressed or when we come to a point of stress, and the, the bad thing is that everybody who knows me and my wife will never believe we'll quarrel. You can be in my house for months and we'll be quarreling. You never know because we'll still be talking. Now, I'm saying that to say that God is very concerned with what we do when we are stressed. Or when we come to the point when we feel like this is not going the way I have planned it. Which is always the result of stress. Which is always the reason why we allow ourselves to be distressed. God is very concerned about what we do when things don't go the way we want. David had come to a point in his life when, you know when I read the scriptures, you, you know, I like, I like the emphasis here. And at taking captive, verse 2, the women, so, you know, <laughs> When the Bible says that David, you know, it started with the women, because David was a man of the women. 
So when the Bible that the, the, I don't know why the Bible began with the women. What about the men? And the women, they were all taken captive. And everyone that followed David, the only thing they could think of was even stoning David. I mean, if you were David, if you were in David's shoes, what would you have done? Things are not going well. And the only people who could encourage you are thinking in themselves of stoning you. But the Bible says that and David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. Let me start by saying there is no aspect of your life that God is not interested in. Some people believe, oh, God is only interested in me coming to church and if I'm not in church, that settles it. No. Do you know that as little as managing your finances, God is interested? Because God knows he cannot bring you to plenty if you don't, if you don't learn how to manage the small things. God knows he cannot prosper you if you don't learn to value ideas. So as little as the ideas, the little ideas that you think about, God is interested in every phase. There is, no, there is nothing about your life that God is not interested in. Nothing. You know what the Bible says? It says that even your hair that they are numbered, that not even one falls down without God thinking about it. Can someone say amen? Tell somebody, God is interested in every area of my life. Say it again, say God is interested in every aspect of my life. And that's the reason, and that is the reason why God gave us his word so that we are able to follow the laws. I found out that God gave the Israelites over 600 laws. And you find that up to, up to the food that they eat, there were laws regarding those things. And I have often, I have often said, how, how, detailed, how detailed must God have been? The very first thing that God wants us to understand is that we must come to a point when we take his word literally, when we take his word seriously, when we take his word as though our life depends on it. The very first key to finding stability regarding your emotions, regarding anger, regarding whatever, name all the emotions you can put together. The very first thing to do, especially in this world that we live in, is to take the word of God very, very seriously. I know sometimes people say that People try, not people say, people try to, people try to use the word of God to gratify their own sinful desires, especially when the word of God has not said so. Take for instance, I'm, I have a long note, so I'm going to take my time. I'll try and stay between 15 more minutes so I can close and continue next week. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23, he says, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Now, in taking the word of God, in taking the word of God more seriously, God wants us to understand that he says what he means and he means what he says. God does not joke with his word. God does not joke with what he says. 
And God wants us to take what, is, what he says the way that he said it in order for us to have a clear and easy application to our lives. So, for instance, people will take that scripture, a little wine for your stomach's sake, and then they get into alcohol and start... And they'll argue and say, well, Jesus turned water to wine. You know, Paul was speaking to Timothy about a little wine because, because for health reasons. And the word there was even to use it. I remember some years ago when I started taking red wine. I've, not, I've never taken it in my entire life for years. And then one day I was, I was in a place and then I was sharing with you during the week. And I ate something and my stomach was reacting immediately. And I said, well, does anybody have any red wine around here? It was my first time actually. And someone said, oh yeah, come, come, take this, give me a cup. And I took a shot. Yeah, shot. <laughs> David, the way you are looking at me. <laughs> oh, my, it was good. Then the following day, I wanted more, but my stomach was not stunning yet. <laughs> so stunning again. <laughs> oh, Lord. Then it went past the following day. The following week, I went by myself to buy it. I <laughs> said, <laughs> And then one day my wife saw red wine in the fridge and said, ah, man of God. <laughs> and then I said, yeah, I said, yes. I, you know, I used my bold face. I said, yeah. Then I realized that just a sip was, was growing into an habit. And then I just caught it off and I said, no, 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 no. That was just a face. I cleared it off. And I said, now God wants us to take his word seriously. And not to the point when we use his word to satisfy something just because we want to do it. It is one thing to use the word of God to, I mean, to deal with the issue than to use the word of God as a, as a yeah, I mean, it's not everything we should get angry at. I don't know if you know that. It's not everything we should get angry at. Proverbs says that anger rests in the bosom of a fool. So a foolish man wants to always get angry. He gets angry at everything. And yet the Bible says, be hungry, but sin not. So if you are always angry, you get angry every time. And you say, well, the Bible says, be hungry, but sin not. But you are mixing, you are mixing it up. Because the Bible says that anger rests in the bosom of food. So if anger has become an habit, then there's a problem. So God wants us to use his word not as an excuse to gratify our sinful desire. Tell yourself, God wants us to use his word for what it says. Now that's a simple secret actually to finding stability in God, especially as it affects your emotional life, is to take God's word for what he actually says. You, I mean, have you ever heard about a man named Adam, the first man? In three Genesis chapter Genesis chapter three verse one, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. Somebody's asking about sure, is red wine a sin? Somebody just asked that question. Is that I'll answer it later. <laughs> <laughs> now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, "Did God really say?" You must not eat from the tree in the garden. Did God really say? The first thing I want, us to, rem I want to remind you is that first and foremost, a believer is somebody. What defines you as a believer is because you have come to the point in your life where you have decided to take, to take God's word for what he says. And until you, have, until you are at that point, I cannot boldly say that you are a believer. Because until you come to the point when you, when you say, you know what, I, do, I really don't have to be able to explain everything that God says. I just take it. I remember. <laughs> you know, God's word says, love your wife. 
that your prayers will not be in that. That one reason why I am being compelled to make sure that I am constantly obeying the word of God in the aspect of loving my wife regardless of what she does is even not because of her it's because of the way I take God's word most seriously. Now you find the balance in your life now that there are certain things you would not do. There are certain things you would do not because of people now but because you want to hold because you honor God and you hold the word of God seriously. Can someone say amen? Say to yourself, I'm a believer. Say, I'm a believer and I hold the word of God very seriously. Say, I hold the word of God for what he says. So we find that Abraham, I mean Adam, sorry. Adam was a perfect man. Adam was a what? He was what? Adam was perfect. And I said that for us to understand for us to understand who God has really made us to be in the new covenant and how go, and what God expects of us with the life that he has given us through Christ. One man we have to study is Adam. I can't imagine how strong the man was. I can't imagine the level of intelligence that Adam was, and that Adam had. The Bible says that he literally named all the animals that even today some, of, some people will spend four years in school to learn, and for a lifetime they are still learning. One man named all of those animals. He named all the fish in the sea. So he went from land... <coughs> He went into the sea and he named all of them. He named all the birds of the air. I'm wondering, was he flying? Was Adam able to fly in the air? Can someone say amen? Was he? He named all of them. Even though, even though he was, even though he had no PhD, he was a perfect expression of God's intelligence. Can someone say amen? And in, in, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God told him, God told him, have dominion. And I said that when God said to him, have dominion, God simply gave him an instruction. God was not, I mean, God was not giving him, I mean, an, an idea or an advice. God told him, listen, Adam, have dominion. So Adam had dominion over everything. So he was a man, he was a man that reflects the image of God. So when you, when you ask him, what does God look like? Look at Adam. Because the Bible said that God made him in his image and his likeness. So it was a perfect expression of what a God would look like. That was Adam. And that was before the fall. And what led to the fall was this. Did God really say? What is the point I'm driving at today? If you are really going to be very stable emotionally, the very first thing to do is to take God's word for what he's saying. God is not joking. God is not playing. God meant everything that he said. And God said it because it is able to address every pending situation in our lives. The greatest thing that Adam lost when he fell was the capacity to reflect God. So before the fall, it was a perfect expression of God. He was stable. There was no, no problem. Everything was going fine. No sin, no guilt, no condemnation, no drugs, nothing. But the moment he fell, <clears throat> he lost that capacity. And then what happened was he became a man. He started living like a man. He's now living less than a God. What was the greatest thing he lost? Is that image. Is that likeness. Adam doesn't, need, you know, I mean, at the time when he lived, he doesn't need any law. He knew God. God was, I mean, God was real to him. And the Bible says that God, that in the cool of the day, God will come down, in the, I mean, in the garden, and Abraham and God will be gisting. There was fellowship. 
So he had no broken fellowship. There was no sin in the day that he lived. One of the greatest things I want you to understand is this. I want you to write it down because it's about, the, it's about what unlocks this message. That man will ultimately become very rebellious at the point when he begins to individually or personally question what the word of God says. There is no way the devil can bring you out of the great things that God is doing in your life. There is no way the devil can push you towards instability, especially regarding your emotional life, until he is able to make you look down on what the word of God says. Man will ultimately come to a very rebellious point where he rejects the government of God. Now the first thing first is this, and this, this, this affects us more, especially those of us who are still struggling to find some level of emotional balance Maybe you are dealing with one thought today, dealing with one thought tomorrow, dealing with one habit today, dealing with one habit tomorrow. The very first thing is that there has to be a sincere alignment back to God for you to find that balance. See, God never created you to live by rules. Even check, I'll tell you why God was tired of the law, because no one could keep the law. It was too much, 600 and something laws. Because God, by design, we were not created to live by laws. By design. By our initial configuration. It wasn't laws that brings us to what we want. No. It was that image of God in us. Because that was what we lost when Adam fell. That is the only thing we must pursue for us to find balance in our emotional life. Until you start to pursue a sincere alignment with God. It must be something you do consciously, like Adam would do. So that meant that Adam found his strength, Adam found his courage, Adam found his, his, um, his, his definition for life by the fellowship that he had with God on a consistent basis. As a matter of fact, the environment that we live in, it feels like it puts us even much more under pressure. Puts us under prayer to do what is wrong. And a lot of young people are victims of certain things that when they sit down by themselves, they just ask themselves only one question. How did I get here? And it gets so bad that, like I said, like I made mention of how I entered red wine and it became, it almost became an addict. And I had to tell myself, I didn't even pray about it, funny enough. I didn't fast about it. I didn't read any book about it. Ten steps to stop drinking red wine. <laughs> I, didn't see any, I just told myself, I'm not cut out for this. Get out of it. I packed it and then it's gone. Because that is exactly how God. See, let me tell you. The problem is inside, it's not outside. The problem is not what you do primarily. No, 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 no. The problem is who you are, who you are training yourself to be. And the answer also is inside. The answer is what are you developing inside to fight what is fighting you inside? Because all the fight is inside. So you can see a young man walking down the road. And I mean, it looks very innocent, but he has a gun in his pocket. Nobody can tell. It's not even much of the gun. It's what is inside. Because what is inside is what drives what is on the outside. 